Community Movement. This is the January 19th Solidarity Spear Study Live. This is a weekly political education program um, that is under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party as part of Uhuru Solidarity Movement's um, expansive uh, social media presence. I'm uh, happy to host this program every week. Again, my name is Valerie Bronte. I'm from Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And as you're coming into the live stream today, please share this to your timeline. Invite people that you think might be interested. Share this to groups that are um, that are having robust discussions with anti-imperialism, colonialism, and um, the state of uh, parasitic capitalism today, which as we understand it through the leadership of Chairman Amal Yeshitel is in complete crisis and is in rapid, rapid decline. Thank you for coming and joining the study. I see that we already have eight viewers. I want to say uhuru to everyone. I hope everyone had an incredible, exciting week. I know that there is a big snowstorm that's about to hit a lot of cities um, in the Midwest. I want to say uhuru to Rose Latoul from Oakland, California. Uhuru, comrade, how are you? I'm a little sick today, so um, um, my voice definitely reflects that. But um, we have a great study today planned and an excellent article, and I'm just going to uh, jump right into it. So again, I said, um, I'm from Uhuru Solidarity Movement. We are the organization of white people organizing for white reparations to African people, working under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. So I want to salute Chairman Omali Eshetele, the leader of the African People's Socialist Party. The African People's Socialist Party was founded in 1972. It was formed by the merging of three organizations, JOMO, the Junta of Militant Organizations, the Black Rights Fighters from Fort Myers, Florida, and the Black Study Group of Gainesville, Florida. African People's Socialist Party leads the African working class and the oppressed masses of the world. Um, in uh, contention with uh, capitalist colonial domination and all of the oppression that results from that relationship. And the party recognizes that African people are, uh, Black people are not a race, they are a nation of people whose birthright is Africa, and that their character, the char specific characterization of their oppression within U.S. borders is a domestic or internal colonialism. So the issue isn't um, ideas in people's heads. It's not the ideology of racism. It is the um, colonial assault on Africa, the stolen lives and labor of African people that built North American um, cities to benefit uh, Europeans and their descendants. And um, and that and that is the the root contradiction. It's colonialism, and racism itself is an ideolo ideological contradiction. And the African People's Socialist Party, under Chairman Omalia Shetela, have defined that the strategy is to combat colonialism and parasitic capitalism and build for genuine economic development and self-determination for African people, that it is to build dual and contending power in the under the leadership of the African working class. It is not to fight against the ideas in white people's heads. So I wanna again salute chairman of the African People's Socialist Party, Omalia Shetela, and um, the Burning Spear, which was first published by Jomo in 1968, so about 50 years ago, um, was uh, continued to be published by the African People's Socialist Party um, and has been in uninterrupted publication since 1968. So 50 years of uninterrupted publication, the only Black Power revolutionary newspaper that can say that is the voice of the International African Revolution. It's print and online, published by the party, laid out by the party, led by the party. It's affiliated with the African liberation movement worldwide and presents the perspective of the African working class, the materialist philosophy, a political philosophy um, founded by Chairman Amalia Shetela called African internationalism. So um, we study the burning spear as part of the solidarity movement because as white people, as the beneficiaries of capitalism and colonialism, we can't come to this, these conclusions on our own, like, 
Like there is no education. There's no college course. Like you can't intellectually approach the idea of solidarity um, and take a truly progressive stance unless you're under the correct leadership because white people will sell out the revolution every single time. White people as beneficiaries of parasitic capitalism, as beneficiaries of imperialism, all you have to do is say boo, and they are gone from any true meaningful stance of solidarity with total African liberation. And that's just the reality of it. So we are under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. We are not white saviors. We are not... Um, we are not uh, in control of the strategy. We are part of the strategy by advancing the African revolution under the party's leadership into the white community. So bringing the revolutionary demand for reparations into the white community, that is the goal of the solidarity movement. So in 1976, the African People's Socialist Party solved the question about what to do about white people by forming the African People's Solidarity Committee. And that was where Chairwoman Penny Hess, who was really the the first person that can call themselves like a genuine white socialist um, joins uh, leads uh, the African People's Solidarity Committee even to today. So the last 40 years, over 40 years of Penny Hess's life have been leading um, the solidarity movement and working in the institutions of Black Star Industries to which all of the resources go. So all of the resources go to Black Star Industries, which then, then is like the umbrella network to provide funding for all sorts of projects for economic liberation and self-determination for African working class people in Oakland, California, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and in um, St. Petersburg, uh, Florida, and in Huntsville, Alabama. So the um, Uhuru Solidarity Movement has three um, principles of unity, and the three principles of unity are we work under the leadership of and are accountable to the African People's Socialist Party. African people have the right to lead their own struggle, and we organize in the white community for reparations. So why do we say Uhuru? So if you're just tuning in, the reason that we say Uhuru all the time is because we're called upon the party to use it as a as a salutation, as a greeting, as a word of unity, to keep the, um, freedom on our minds 24-7. Uhuru is the Swahili word for freedom. So that is why we use the word Uhuru. So I see that we have 18 viewers in here today. This is really awesome. And I'm going to start the article. You can find it online. And our moderator, I want to salute our moderator, um, Johan Bedingfield, who helps me with the Spear Study every week, keeps it on point, makes sure that we get um, all of our posts across social media to let people know that we are going to be advancing African internationalism every week onto the timelines of white people on Facebook to let them know that there is a way that they can jump ship from this crisis of parasitic capitalism and imperialism that is going to take everybody down. So um, yeah, the article is um, from the 2016 January issue. I'm waiting for it to show up in the comments before I start. The struggle continues. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., January 15th, 1929. To April 4th, 1968. And then there is a, um, a graphic that says Martin Luther King Jr. did not die of natural causes. January 15th is celebrated as MLK Day, a gift to black people from the state for their murder of the civil rights movement leader. April 4th should be, however, recognized as the day that the U.S. government placed an attack on one of our leaders who was beginning to make the demand for black power. It's a quote from theburningspear.com. It says, editor's note, this piece was originally published January 5th, 2016. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. The man who was tried, convicted, and imprisoned for his murder was James Earl Ray, a white man who would die in prison years after attempting to recant his confession. What needs to be remembered, however, is that King's murder followed the assassination of Malcolm X by three years. In fact, King was killed during a period where African leaders were being murdered with regularity. 
Oakland, California police killed Bobby Hutton of the Black Panther Party on April 6, 1968, two days after King's assassination. More than 30 members of the Black Panther Party were assassinated throughout the U.S. and another 300 or more imprisoned in that same year, 1968. This was the time frame for the overthrow of Nkrumah in Ghana, the brutal murder of Patrice Lumumba in Congo, and the capture and assassination of a wounded Che Guevara in Bolivia, and the December 4th, 1969 murder of Fred Hampton by the FBI-assisted Chicago Police Department. What needs to be said is no matter who actually murdered King and whether or not there were accomplices in his own organization, as was likely with Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. died as a result of a sweeping U.S.-led counterinsurgent campaign to rescue a badly wounded world capitalist system that was tottering from the struggles of the colonized peoples of the world over. What needs to be said is that capitalism as a parasitic social system exists because European imperialists enslaved and colonized Africans and other peoples whose who, who systemic exploitation and oppression is necessary for the success of the system. The murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. by an arm of the U.S. government was carried out to prevent African people from escaping our colonial enslavement. It was part of a general war against the colonized Africans and other peoples of the world fighting to be free and self-determining. The death of Martin Luther King Jr. nearly 48 years ago was part of a U.S. counterinsurgency that pushed African people out of political life for more than two generations. The massive imprisonment of African people in the U.S., more than one million potential revolutionaries, along with the military occupation of our colonized communities, is something our struggle is only now beginning to over overcome. African militants, however, will be unable to understand the nature of the system we are fighting and its inherent weakness during this time of rapidly developing radical consciousness without discussing Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. It was the young African working class militants in Ferguson who helped us break free from a critical aspect of the counterinsurgency by engaging the murderous police military occupation and combat these young people on Canfield Drive have broken through the impact of the counterinsurgency that crushed the Black Revolution of the 60s with assassinations, slander, and mass imprisonment. Understanding the significance of the life and death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in this light helps us all to understand that the U.S. murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. ultimately failed in its intent to destroy the struggle of our people for freedom from U.S. colonialism. The next step is full independence and self-determination under the leadership of the African working class through its advanced detachment, the African People's Socialist Party. Build the African People's Socialist Party, prepare to win, prepare to govern Uhuru. I wanna just salute this article and salute the Burning Spear newspaper one more time. And um, the Burning Spear newspaper is uh, under the Department of Agitprop, um, led by the director of the Department of Agitprop, Akila An Anai, and the managing editor is Olafin Akemba. And this, you know, just uh, want to salute the Burning Spear staff for the Burning Spear newspaper every month. If you do not subscribe to the Burning Spear newspaper, if you um, do not have a distributor bundle to sell the Burning Spear newspaper. What you need to do is to go to burningspearmarketplace.com and you can also um, pre-order the chairman's report to the 7th Congress of the African People's Socialist Party, which just took place in St. Louis, Missouri at um, Aquaba Hall at the Uhuru House in St. Louis, the brand new Uhuru House in St. Louis that was uh, pos made possible by supporters of the Black Power Blueprint, which are the programs for economic development and self-determination happening in St. Louis, Missouri right now.
All right, I've been told the sound is on or the sound is off. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Can somebody say something? It looks like it's been off for like 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm really I'm really self-critical for that because basically what I was trying to explain was how the FBI has advanced counterinsurgency in just very basic and typical ways repeatedly throughout the last century to discredit and delegitimize not only the struggle of African people and colonized people to have self-determination and have control over their resources and their lives, but that it always functions in these very like typical lowbrow ways. Like there's always an attack on the propriety of the financial dealings of the organization, some distorted, you know, redacted files, some cropped images, gossip about how finances are sought, managed or spent. There's always an attack on the morality of the leadership, the personal morality of leadership. There's always insinuations of sexual deviance or family neglect. The leadership is always painted as angry. The organizations are painted as angry and frightening so that you sympathize with the attacker as being victimized by the organization. So the state loves to delegitimize the anger of African people. And as, as an emotional thing, as people who are un, unsettled or unstable, rather than the legitimate legal grievances of the people who have been continuously oppressed. So the attacker also is often someone who spends a short but intense period of time associating with the organization. So they claim intimacy about the internal workings. And then, but at the same time, you have to wonder because they're uh, they're concealing their true uh, intentions and stance for months, for months, uh, um, you know, just withholding information and, and not being forthright about their true intentions. So J. Edgar Hoover makes a career of slandering and persecuting African liberation leaders. J. Edgar Hoover is the first director of the FBI. So famous for waging war against the Black Panther Party and the Black Power movements of the 60s and 70s, created the counterinsurgency program of surveillance and violence known as COINTELPRO. So through COINTELPRO, the United States government is responsible for the deaths of King, the deaths of Malcolm X, the deaths of Fred Hampton, the deaths of, you know, uh, over two dozen Black Panther um, associates and, uh, and members through, we see COINTELPRO coming back again today as the Black Identity Extremist Terrorist designation of the FBI. It's re the return of the state to delegitimize and suppress the African liberation movement. It's announcing the FBI's intentions of criminalizing the struggle of African people for control over their own lives and resources. So the purpose of COINTELPRO is to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, otherwise neutralize the activities of the black nationalists, what they call hate type organizations or groupings. And that includes their leadership, spokesmen, membership, and supporters. And so we saw this in attacks on Martin Luther King by the FBI in 1960. He was the first person ever criminally charged in the state of Alabama on tax fraud, which he was acquitted for. The FBI was obsessed with exposing the ties between King and communism and was coming up with nothing time and time again. So documents that are now declassified today show that the FBI was obsessed with smearing King's personal reputation, detailing alleged affairs, uh, affairs and describing lewd sex acts and saying that he had a, a daughter with one of his mistresses and uh, historian Taylor Branch uh, points to documents um, that were sent by the FBI that have now been declassified, a so-called suicide package that contained audio recordings um, that, that, you know, JFK had authorized the tapping of Martin Luther King Jr.'s phone and the audio recordings, and there were bugs in his hotel room. And so the tape was pre um, prepared by this FBI technician and documented, uh, you know, uh, sexual indiscretions. And then there was a letter telling him that he had to kill himself uh, before he accepted, accepted the Nobel Peace Prize. And even after King died, 
um, the media would not let up. So various news organizations like Newsweek and Newsday that were popular at the time continued to discredit and smear King's name even after he died, even as late as 1969. So um, attacks on Malcolm X. I mean, Malcolm X uh, was, you know, it was one of these circumstances when Malcolm X was assassinated in Harlem that the you know, this is the quote from Earl Grant, one of Malcolm X's associates who was present during the association. He said, uh, during the assassination, he said about five minutes later, a most incredible scene took place into the hall, sauntered, excuse me. Into the hall sauntered about a dozen policemen. They were strolling at about the pace one would expect of them if they were patrolling a quiet park. They did not seem to be at all excited or concerned about the circumstances. I could hardly believe my eyes. Here were New York City policemen entering a room for for which at least a dozen shots had been heard, and yet not one of them had his gun out. As a matter of absolute fact, some of them even had their hands in their pockets. So we see how the state collaborates with infiltrators. The FBI hired its first African investigator to pursue its campaign against Marcus Garvey. And that was, of course, when it was not even called the FBI, but was a young 19 year old J. Edgar Hoover, who was, you know, intent for his entire life and his entire career was on bringing down black liberation organizations. So there was a mail fraud scheme that because after five years of surveillance by the, you know, what this organization that was to be the predecessor of the FBI, there was nothing else that could be found that was untoward about Marcus Garvey or the UNIA or Black Star shipping lines. So the mail fraud scheme surrounded around a boat that was featured in a brochure. So in 1923, Marcus Garvey spent three months at the tombs in New York City awaiting a bail determination, awaiting a bail determination in New York City and spent three months without a charge. Sounds very familiar. So it's because it deliberately was familiar. It deliberately was familiar. So an organization, the United Negro Improvement Organization had 11 million members. So of course the state sees the UNIA as a threat. It sees the independent economic development of African people as a threat and attacks Marcus Garvey and throws him in jail for five years. Hiring its first African investigators to infiltrate the UNIA. So this is how the state works. And it was able to crush the UNIA organization by removing Garvey, removing the leadership. And the US is involved in a worldwide counterinsurgency against colonized people and their self-determination. And we saw that of course in Vietnam, which had declared independence decades before we had even set foot there. And we had propped up governments to disrupt and cause a civil strife. And, 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 and all sorts of assassinations and, and, and espionage and creating paranoia and dropping propaganda all over Vietnam. We assassinated Patrice Lumumba, we removed Kwame Nkrumah, and now we see today through this COINTELPRO 2.0, the determination of black identity extremists, which was this August report from the FBI in 2017, black identity extremists likely motivated to target law enforcement officers. That was the title of the report, citing Michael Brown's shooting by Ferguson, Missouri police officers and the subsequent decision not to indict him as evidence that BIEs or black identity extremists are likely to target law enforcement. So we have the Southern Poverty Law Center and other liberal orgs who are a front for liberal white nationalism who seek to criminalize and isolate the African independence movement. So the US government, just as it did in the 1960s, the Black Panthers to neutralize black nationalist hate type organizations, COINTELPRO is back. So the definitions provided by the FBI for what constitutes a black identity extremist include identifying as a black, Muslim, Moorish, African, et cetera, while pursuing a liberated 
quote unquote, black homeland and building black autonomous social institutions. So as white people, we have to defend the African community's right for self-determination and control over their own resources. The black identity extremist designation, the infiltration and uh, discrediting neutral attempts to neutralize uh, an African liberation movement has to be seen for what it really is, the attacks uh, on self-determination and black power led by the state. So as beneficiaries of white power and colonialism, as on the pedestal of the oppression of all the world's people, white people have to overturn the relationship to the state. We are born parasitic on the backs of stolen African labor and lives. And so when the King said of the Vietnam War that the great initiative of this war is ours, the initiative to stop it must be ours at the Riverside Church speech. We too, white people, have to realize that no one but ourselves is responsible for returning stolen lives, labor, and resources from Africa and African people. And no one wants our tears or empty apologies, and even those are not even forthcoming. So the chairman teaches us that the political and economic are one. And so every week we have our political education where we study African internationalism so that we can really drill down to the heart of the matter of how there needs to be an economic basis. There needs to be an economic basis for the liberation of African people, just as there was an economic basis for the oppression of African people. And we know that the capital, the stolen, the resources, stolen resources are hoarded in the white community. So we're advancing the African revolution into the white community by advancing the revolutionary demand for reparations every week on the Solidarity Spear study. And this week is no different. Our goal is $75. So put your pledge in the comments and we will tally, tally them up. And in the interim, I will tell you about the incredible Black Power Blueprint phase three that will be coming into being in 2019. The Uhuru Jiko Community Kitchen, it's phase 3.1. The Uhuru Jiko Community Kitchen is happening in 2019. So there's already a building that the African People's Education and Defense Fund, the Black Power Blueprint, has secured in North St. Louis. It needs renovations and needs outfitting to be a commercial kitchen. It will be a community commercial kitchen, which means that people can jumpstart their businesses there. It will also be a liberated meeting space for people to meet and eat, it will be a venue, there'll be a community garden in the backyard, and it will um, have entrepreneurship and job training programs for the African independence workforce, which um, the housing is now under construction right now, so that they're working on a fourplex right now so that it can have housing for people who are transitioning from incarceration back into their neighborhood and need to have job skills and entrepreneurship skills to thrive and to be a part of the reclaiming of North St. Louis by the African working class. And that is what the Black Power Blueprint is. And I just wanna salute the Black Power Blueprint and Deputy Chair of the African People's Socialist Party, Ona Zanea Shatella, who leads this economic work, who leads the chairman's vision for self-determination and economic development for the black community in the hands of the black community. And so we have just incredible victories over the last year. There are over two dozen independent economic institutions, different economic institutions. And all of this goes towards securing self-determination and genuine economic development for the African working class. So please put your, your uh, pledges in the comments. We have a $75 goal today and $75. It might not seem like a lot, it might seem like a lot, depending on where you're at in your life, but we also encourage that you join a Huru Solidarity Movement. You can become a member today and you can um, pledge whatever you want to pledge for this year. You can pledge as a monthly sustainer of a Huru Solidarity Movement. There are multiple monthly sustainership levels starting at $5. And that is another way that you can return reparations as a sustaining member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. In addition to that, you can raise funds in your own community um, towards reparations through the Reparations Challenge. And every Saturday, there is a, every Sunday, there is a meeting for the Reparations Challenge, and they will help you um, plan your event 
plan your activity and pl or, or plan, um, say you're an accountant and you're going to do taxes and you're going to give 50% of whatever you raise from the taxes back to the Black Power Blueprint. That's something you can do. And on uh, January 21st, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, um, four different organizations of the Uhuru Movement, sorry, five different organizations of the Uhuru Movement are holding MLK Day events and volunteer projects in Oakland, California, Uhuru Foods and Pies and Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles are holding the Oakland MLK Day event and volunteer project. Contact 510-763-3342, extension 3, or Oakland at uhuruvolunteer.org. And uh, moderator Johan will put the links for all of these in here. Um, in Philly on Martin Luther King Day, the Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles um, we'll hold their MLK Day event and volunteer project. Contact 215-546-9616, extension 3, or UFC Philly Marketing at gmail.com. In St. Louis, Missouri, APDF, sorry, APEDF, the African People's Education and Defense Fund, Black Power Blueprint, MLK Day event and volunteer project in St. Louis. Um, there will be an MLK Day event and volunteer project at Zen Zele Consignment um, that will be led by the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project. January 22nd, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement is having its webinar, Victory to the Mexican People, Down with Trump's Wall and Colonial Borders. And that will be on YouTube.com forward slash Uhuru Solidarity. February 23rd in Boston and ongoing through March 27th, stopping in New York City, St. Pete, Gainesville, St. Louis, and Louisville with more dates being added. The All Diamonds or Blood Diamonds Tour featuring Yejide Oranmila, president of the African National Women's Organization, Akili Anai, director of the Ad Department of Agit Prop of the African People's Socialist Party, USM Chair Jesse Neville, and APSC Northern Coordinator Connor Voss. That's going to be really exciting. You can donate your diamonds, return your diamonds back to the African Revolution. April 14th and 15th is the Uhuru Solidarity Movement 2019 National Convention in St. Louis, Missouri at the beautiful Uhuru House in the Quaba Hall on 4101 West Florissant. Saturdays, every Saturday here at 6 p.m. Eastern, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement does the Solidarity Spirit Study Live where we read an article, read and study an article from the Burning Spear newspaper and discuss it. Sundays at 8 a.m., the Amali Taught Me Political Study with Chairman Omali Yeshitela. You can watch it live on Facebook at Omali Yeshitela's Facebook page, or you can watch it live on YouTube. Go to Uhuru TV. So I want to check out the comments, and I want to say Uhuru to everyone and say I'm so sorry that I didn't notice that I wasn't, I couldn't be heard. I want to say Uhuru to Kristen Forthen, to Evan Garner, to Jeanette Bish Cruz, to Jake Scott, to Jesse Neville, to Rose Latoul, to Paula Lipsy. I want to say Uhuru to Santosh Rohit. I want to say Uhuru to Ali Flo Ayello. Uhuru comrades, Uhuru Jackson, Uhuru Demetrius Cooper from Seattle. Oh, I'm so sorry I had no sound. Oh, that stinks. All right. Okay, cool. So I want to salute Jackson Hollingsworth comment. That's right. So much bloodshed by this government found on slavery and genocide and maintained by that today. Uhuru. Uhuru John Hill. They slander all the true. Here we go. This is a great comment. Thank you, Jackson. They slander. Here we go. They slander all the true revolutionaries and all who fight for African people to discredit them and rally support for attacking them. They killed King, Malcolm X, Huey P. Newton, Fred Hampton, Bobby Hutton, Patrice Lamunda, and have tried to kill Chairman Amalia Shatella. Long live African martyrs and not in our name will they be slandered and attacked. Uhuru, long live Marcus Garvey. Who, comrade Johan, I will do $35 for February 1st on February 1st for the study. Or who, that will go towards our February goal. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, we still have lots of events and we have meetings every week all over the country for Uhuru Solidarity Movement. There are open meetings on Mondays in a lot of cities. So 
6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. USM Boston it has its open meeting at the Boston Public Library at Copley Square in the Newsfeed Cafe. Monday, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern, USM Asheville has its open meetings at Firestorm Books and Coffee at 610 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina. Monday, 6 p.m. Central Time, USM St. Louis has its open meeting at Lemp Neighborhood Art Center. Monday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, USM St. Pete has its open meeting at Panera Bread, 1908 4th Street North, St. Petersburg, Florida. USM Philly has its meetings Thursdays at 7 p.m. at the open meeting is at Good Karma Cafe on Pine Street in Philadelphia. Fridays at 11 a.m. is the National Committee to Build the 2019 USM Convention. Email or info at ahurusolidarity.org if you want to be a part of planning that. Wednesday, January 23rd at 7 p.m. is the New York City Open Meeting at the Uhuru Solidarity Center at TBG 616 East 9th Street, New York. Saturday, February 2nd at 1 p.m. is the Planet Uhuru Open Meeting. You can register at Planet Uhuru 2019 eventbrite.com Saturday, February 2nd at 3 p.m. USville, Kentucky, uh, USM Lewis, Louisville, Kentucky, open meeting at Heine Brothers Coffee on 1250 Bardstow Road. And Monday, February 4th at 7 p.m., USM Oakland, California has its first open meeting at Cafe Strata in Berkeley, 2300 College Avenue. On Sundays, we have our rep reparations challenge mass meeting. And there will be a link to that as well. And our other announcements is that we have Art for Reparations is having a fall 2019 benefit auction. Submissions are open. They're open right now. So go to artforreparations.org to learn more about that. And the Planet Uhuru 2019 calendar is available at planetuhuru.com forward slash journals. Uhuru. Let me check back in with the comments. And so... Yeah, we what we see what we see because we're under the correct leadership is that we see the attacks against the African liberation movement as just part and parcel of imperialism and capitalism in crisis. The state has to, you know, it, it's ha it's having to gather up all of its possible agents that it can possibly use to crush the righteous resistance of colonized people all over the world. Okay. So I'm going to um, pledge $10 to this study. I have 11 viewers on the live stream right now. We have uh, another $65 to return in resources as part of this study, as part of this study every week. And I'm going to do $10, so we are at $65. Uhuru to Evan Garner from Asheville, North Carolina. I can pledge $10 in stolen resources on Thursday, the 24th of January. Uhuru, that is $20 towards our $75 goal. Anything that we are not able to raise, we will raise um, in a future study. So we are at $20 and we have $55 left to raise for this study. So yes, what we need to go back for, back and really focus on is that the imperialism and colonialism will not survive a successful reparations struggle. They just won't survive the return of resources and control of those resources to African people. They will not survive the return of land to indigenous people. We're looking at this border wall that has, for some reason, like thousands and thousands of, thousands and thousands of state employees working without pay. And everyone's saying that, oh, well, you know, if they go on strike, it's illegal. Well, it's also illegal not to pay people who are working for you. But all of this is, you know, for the most foolish reason I've ever heard in my entire life. And we wouldn't need a wall if we didn't, hadn't come here and stolen everything from indigenous people. We wouldn't need a wall 
around the southern border of the United States if we hadn't destabilized all of these governments in Central and South America. We wouldn't need a wall if we hadn't created MS-13. We wouldn't need a wall if we hadn't been personally responsible for the advancing of narco corruption in Mexico. We wouldn't need a wall if we hadn't stolen the water rights of the Rio Grande. We wouldn't need a wall if Arizona and California weren't the most parasitic entities on the water table there. We wouldn't need a wall around the southern end of the United States if we had never come here and assaulted indigenous people and moved them into concentration camps. And it's because we're against this and we want to overturn these conditions that we organize under the leadership of the International African Revolution as part of a reverse solidarity movement. So that is why we forward the demand, the revolutionary demand for reparations because we want to divest from white power, we want to divest from white nationalism, we want to return the resources to the African liberation, and we want to say no more genocide in our name. We want to say no more genocide in our name. No more complicity with a system that has its boot on the neck of the majority of the people living on earth. And that is what reparations is going to. It's going to programs for people to feed, house, and clothe themselves, to have the ability to produce and reproduce life. And I want to double my pledge to this study. My Throat feels absolutely terrible, unfortunately. I'm getting really, really sick. So we have raised $30 towards the $75 goal. There are 14 viewers. If everyone could put in two, three dollars, we would reach our goal. We would have the, the rest of the $45 that are needed for the goal. So please put your pledge in the comments. But we have to understand that the consolidated state attacks against the African liberation movement are to be expected. They are to be prepared for, they are to be anticipated. And the, this assault, this is assault on the African liberation movement is because just like the wall, just like the wall is, is because imperialism finds itself on the way out. It feels, it sees its particular stakes and claims rapidly vanishing. The, the rug is being pulled out underneath it by the righteous resistance of colonized people from all over the world. So that is what we're seeing right now. This, this need to build a wall, this need to build a wall is because we have stolen things and we're looking to, to lock it up in a hoard. That's, that's all that it is. So I want to salute Jackson Hollingsworth from St. Pete, Florida, $5. Uhuru Comrade, thank you so much for helping to support this spear study. And Santosh Rohit from St. Petersburg, Florida, thank you so much, Comrade, for helping to support this spear study. So that's $20 for me and $10 from Santosh and $10, I'm oh, sorry, $5 from Santosh and $5 from Jackson and $10 from Evan. Uhuru, we're at $40. We have $35 left to go for this study. There are 12 viewers. If any of those 12 viewers can put in $5, we will easily make this goal for the study today. So when we look at the assassination of Martin Luther King. You know, we have to think about the timeline in which it was coming to be like the Riverside Church speech. It's an hour long speech. You can listen to it anywhere. I mean, like most things, um, it's completely transparent now these days, exactly, exactly the motivations behind the discrediting and uh, the attempts to uh, assault the character of Martin Luther King. We can see it very clearly now from this perspective because of the amount of time that has passed and the declassification of FBI art, um, um, articles and, and documents. Uhuru Rose Latul from Oakland, California. I will pledge. Uh, Uhuru, I will pledge five dollars. Fabulous. Okay, now we are at thirty dollars left for this study today. So when we're thinking about Martin Luther King Day, and we're thinking about you know certainly you know the legacy of Martin Luther King as a person fighting for self-determination and liberation of African people, but we also have to think about Martin Luther King Day as this big 
huge uh, artifice that we've been fed of this like nonviolent, um, this nonviolent reverend, you know, that, uh, that, you know, we see streets named after, we see statues to, we see monuments in uh, Washington, D.C., but the state isn't celebrating the legacy of Martin Luther King. It's celebrating its own henchmen extinguishing the power of Martin Luther King because Martin Luther King was beginning to realize that he had, he, the United States government was denying the freedoms of people all over the world. And he was beginning to expose that and people were beginning to rally not only for their, for their own enfranchisement and for their own protection, but they were, if there were ever to be unity amongst all of the colonized people of the world, guess what? White power can't thrive. And if there's unity amongst white people that we need to overturn our relationship to parasitic capitalism, colonialism, it will happen. And uh, imperialism and capitalism will not survive a successful reparation struggle. And so with eight minutes left on the study, put your final pledges in the comments. I am definitely losing my voice. I wanna salute everybody who helped with this study today, who helped us reach our goal of $75. I wanna salute the African People's Socialist Party for giving me this opportunity to be a part of the strategy for the African revolution by advancing the African revolution, by building the culture of white reparations to African people. I wanna salute the Burning Spear newspaper being such a powerful voice for the freedom and liberation of colonized people everywhere. And I want you to check out Planet Uhuru, check out this Art for Reparations auction where you can return your art that you make as, um, as reparations to the African Revolution. And all of the um, products that you can buy on Planet Uhuru, the cool t-shirts and bags and stickers all go towards Black Star Industries, which all goes towards the Black Power Blueprint. And that's something that is the most positive and wonderful thing that you could be a part of. It is not a charity stance. It is a truly progressive stance of reparations to African people. And it is the only stance that a white person who calls themselves a revolutionary can take. Uhuru, Jeanette Bish Cruz, returning $10. Uhuru, comrade, that's fabulous. So now we have $20 left on the study today. And I want to again, thank everybody who has supported this. Go check out the local All Diamonds Are Blood Diamonds tour date near you. It's in the Midwest. It's in the Northeast. It's in the Southeast. And there are more dates being added. Check out a Martin Luther King Day um, event and volunteer project in St. Louis, in Huntsville, Alabama, in Oakland, and in Philly and get to know those institutions, especially if you live there. If you don't know about Uhuru Furniture or Uhuru Foods and Pies, you really need to get, get to know those institutions and volunteer there because they are making a genuine difference. And I want to salute um, everybody who has shared this. It is super important that we get the word out and make sure that we organically can build this movement because we don't use any sort of um, social media boosts. We don't use any sort of ads. All of the things that, that, that are advanced through our social media presence are done by all of us here at Uhuru Solidarity Movement. So thank you for sharing. This means a huge deal. We are able to win the war of ideas on Facebook and YouTube and bring this message into the timelines of white people who are looking for a way out of this parasitic system, this parasitic relationship and reparations is that way out. So I want to salute everybody who, who has uh, paid reparations today. Uhuru, yes, we need $20 more. Who can put in? We have 13 people watching. We have five minutes remaining. I have a little bit of voice left. And I want to say like just how tremendous this article was because what we need to do is never to see these things as part of an isolation. It is not any particular set of unique circumstances. This is the state attacking African liberation movement. This is the state suppression of the African liberation movement. 
and reparations will create the dual and contending power that will make sure that no leader of African people is murdered by the government ever again. So that is why this demand for reparations is so urgent and so needed and so strategic and material because it will create the conditions for a dual and contending power that will overturn colonialism. So I want to say thank you to everyone who's still on. Thank you to everyone who's shared. Please subscribe to our Who's Solidarity Movement. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Leave a comment if you have any questions about today or if you want to get in touch with anyone about an upcoming meeting. Leave a comment if you want to get in touch about the Uhuru Solidarity Movement 2019 National Convention. Looking through all the comments now. Uhuru. Thank you, everyone, comrades. I'm going to go get some rest and get some vitamin C and uh, put some oregano oil in my water. And we'll just add the $20 onto next week's appeal goal. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Read the Bernie Spear, sell the Bernie Spear, and lead with the Bernie Spear under the leadership of the African International Revolution, the African People's Socialist Party, the Undisputed Advanced Detachment and Revolutionary Vanguard. Uh-huh.